1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have, have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, truly we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along, the, along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. And the issue in our verses this morning is understanding who we are together as the church, as God's church. And it's really vital, because understanding who we are will shape our life together, so that the church is built up now and for eternity. You might remember a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the first part of chapter 11, and Paul wanted us to understand our head. Well, now he wants us to understand our body. Have a look down to verse 29, uh, which was just read for us. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. It's put there as a warning. But the issue is, do we discern the body? Do we recognize who we are as God's church? We thought about the queen earlier. She understands her identity as monarch, and that shapes her behavior. Well, understanding who we are, well, it really matters because it will shape our life together. And how we behave as a church really matters, because the church really matters to God. And so we're going to Corinth again, and we're going to find Paul giving a strong rebuke. You may have noticed that as it was read. Their behavior has gone seriously wrong, and Paul is going to show them why it's such a problem, and he's going to teach them who they really are. So it's our first point, behavior that harms the church. So imagine it's annual review time, or it might be school report time. They say the way to give good feedback is to start with some positives and then move on to the constructive criticism. Here's Paul's feedback on the Corinthians meetings, their annual review. Verse 17, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. Verse 22, what shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Paul's annual review summary, when you meet together, it's doing more harm than good. 
So what is going on? Well, verse 21 gets us into the scene. For in eating, each one of us goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. We know from back in chapter 1 that most of the church in Corinth are not from the high ranks of society. It says not many of you were wise, not many of you were powerful, not many of noble birth. But some were, and so it's likely that the church are meeting in the house of one of the wealthy members, and they're gathering for a meal, the Lord's Supper, and the rich are there, the poor, well, they're still at work, they'll be coming later. And so then the rich, well, they head into the dining room, they shut the door, and they begin the meal. Munch, munch, drink, drink, even getting drunk, and the have-nots are left standing outside in the atrium, hungry, and worse than that, humiliated. Verse 22, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Imagine being in the church in Corinth and seeing the door of that dining room shut and hearing the laughs and the chink of glasses and going hungry. The church of God is to be full of honor. And this behavior says, I despise the church. It pours out shame and it's got no place. They've gathered for the Lord's Supper, but it's a meeting that's become marked by division. Verse 18, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you and I believe it in part. Paul's heard the reports and he's not surprised All the way through the letter, we've been seeing that this young church in Corinth keep on taking on the values of the world. And they're seeking after status in a pagan culture. It's a church more like that episode of The Apprentice than shaped by the gospel. And so here we see it again, that outworking of a me-first, self-promoting attitude. What can I get out of this? What serves me? And they're questions that really matter to the world, They shape what to wear. They shape where to be educated. They shape who we want to be seen with and who we don't want to be seen with. Who to sit next to at school. Who to talk to in the common room. Positioning so that people know that I'm better. It's ugly and it's divisive and it's got into the Corinthian church. And so we have the Lord's Supper, but it's divided. In fact, it's so bad, Paul says, you just can't call it that. Verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. It's more like a pagan party at the temple, the VIP lounge, the private dining room. If your name's not on the list, you're not coming in. And so the haves have, and everyone knows they have, and they've made it very clear. And the have-nots don't have, and they're humiliated. I've been trying to work out in preparation, you know, Are they doing this deliberately? Uh, Or is it just ignorance? Is it callous and calculated? We'll show up and we'll make sure they know that we are better. Well, it could be that. But it could just be kind of thoughtless, ignorant. My priority is myself. That's what I think about. And so I'm just focused on making sure I'm with the people that will build up my status, promote myself. I'll focus on them, and I'm just not really thinking about the collateral damage that is being caused. You may have come across an essay by C.S. Lewis. It's called The Inner Ring. And in it, he, dis- he observes the world, and he observes how different informal groups form, and people want to be in them to gain status. And so he says they're called things like that gang or they or so-and-so and and his set or the inner ring. And what Lewis says, it's the wanting to be in that leads you to stamp down on others. The career-climbing colleague who treads on his or her colleagues to get up the ladder. And that's what's happening in the Corinthian church. And Paul is emphatic, shall I commend you in this? No. No. I will not. This behavior is to despise God's church. And in fact, this division even reveals something about who is genuine in the church. Did you see that in verse 19? I hear there are divisions among you. I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you 
in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Paul is raising the question, will they live with Jesus as Lord, devoted to him and his people? Or is Christianity really just a useful badge to sew on the arm to help them get on in the world? Is it for themselves? And this is such an issue because it's really just in opposition to everything that Jesus died for. This is our second point, behavior that opposes the work of Jesus. So Paul says, let me remind you what the Lord's Supper is really about. Verse 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper is a meal for Christians, people trusting in the Lord Jesus. And it's a meal for remembrance. We saw it there in verse 24. It's there again in verse 25. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And that's a really important thing to grasp. The Lord's Supper is a meal of remembrance. And it is in no sense an offering to God. A while back I was at a training day for new curates. And there was a service with the Lord's Supper. Um, There was bread, there was wine. But the words... And the form around it, well, they were setting up this moment as if we were making an offering to God, making a sacrifice. I didn't join in. That's not the Lord's Supper. And in fact, it's actually a very human-centered ceremony. It's more about me and what I can give. It's insulting to Jesus, as if to suggest his death may have lacked something. There's also nothing in Scripture to support the idea that the elements of the bread or the wine in any way become Jesus' actual body or blood. Where Jesus says, this is my body, well, the Greek language boffins are clear that the verb is means signifies, stands for, represents. And when the disciples were with Jesus as he said that, they could clearly see he was there and he was holding some bread. And actually, the parallel in verse 25, well, it could never work. This cup is the new covenant. I mean, just what would it mean for a cup to be a come, a new covenant? It's clearly representative. It's a meal for remembrance. And that remembrance, well, it's not just simply recalling Jesus' work, but it is to depend on it by faith, and then it is to live in light of it, a meal that shapes our life together. It's a meal that proclaims, verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So what has Jesus achieved by his death? Well, it's worth us just spending a bit of time. This is the heart of the passage to see the work he has achieved. Verse 24, Jesus, when Jesus had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. For you. For you. These are really key words. They speak of substitution. Jesus instituted this meal at the time of the Passover. And the Passover, well, that was the time when God's judgment was to fall on Egypt for its rebellion and opposition and sin. And every firstborn in the land was to die. But God's people were to sacrifice a lamb as a substitute painting its blood on the doorposts. The lamb died in the place of the firstborn, and judgment passed over. And Jesus says, well, that was all pointing to my death on the cross, a death in the place of sinners, for you, on your behalf, for me, for anyone who trusts in him. And the background here is Isaiah 53, where we see this again. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. Jesus, the perfect substitute, he bore in his body the full force of God's right indignation at our rebellion against him, so that we might be redeemed. How ridiculous to use that meal as an opportunity for self-promotion. It's a meal we come to knowing we have nothing to offer before Almighty God. 
And we come as recipients of his undeserved mercy. Perhaps you're looking in on the Christian faith this morning. Well, this is the word that Jesus holds out to you. Forgiveness of sin, freedom from its penalty, peace with God. Will you trust his death as a substitute for you? But Jesus' death doesn't just redeem. It redeems to create something new. Verse 25, in the same way he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The language of covenant is the language of relationship. We had a wonderful wedding here in St. Helens yesterday. Kieran and Lydia formed a covenant. When God redeemed his people from slavery in Egypt, well, it was for a purpose. It was for relationship with him. He made a covenant with them that they might know him, live with him as his treasured possession and serve him. And that covenant was sealed with the blood of bulls, a sign of sin forgiven, of covenant commitment. You can read about that in Exodus 24. But the covenant was only a shadow and it pointed forward to the new covenant, the fullness, the fulfillment of all God's promises. Listen to how Jeremiah describes the new covenant. I will be their God and they shall be my people. They shall all know me from the least to the greatest. I will remember their sins no more. God's promises, his new covenant. And some of us have been studying the book of Hebrews this year in small group Bible studies. And so we've seen that Jesus' blood brings definitive forgiveness, meaning the new covenant is utterly secure. And so as we drink the wine, it speaks of our identity together, sealed by Jesus' blood, God's people joined with Jesus and one another. We brought nothing but our sin. We've been given everything by our Lord, loved by God. And so as we come to share the Lord's Supper together, well, that is what we're proclaiming. And we're to live in light of that reality. And I wonder if that just helps us to think it's not just a meal that is about me and what God has done for me. It is that. But it's also profoundly a meal about what Jesus has done in each of us together. You'll know um, if you're regular on a Sunday morning, we've been collecting bread and wine from tables as we move out of COVID measures. I was chatting to someone this week who said, well, actually, doesn't that give a great opportunity as we're moving around and we can see one another queuing up? Well, just to be looking and thinking about who we are, each one. Jesus died for, joined together as his people. And so we proclaim his death and all it's achieved to one another and to the world. And we do it until he comes, until Jesus returns and we share in the meal it all points to, the wedding banquet with our Lord forever. And so Paul says these divisions in the church, this self-promotion, humiliating others, I cannot commend it. It's in opposition to everything Jesus died for. And so he says you need to change, and it really matters. And that's our third point. Behavior so serious, God will discipline it. So having explained the Lord's Supper, Paul now gives a warning and a call to change. Verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. He's not saying here that we need to make ourselves worthy to come to God. What he's talking about is how we treat each other. Division and humiliating others is to oppose what Jesus died for. It's to stand against him and all that he's doing, like those, well, those who called for his crucifixion, to be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. One writer puts it this way, helpfully, I think. The warning is not designed to, to send us on an endless and ultimately fruitless internal quest to find some worthiness in us as we approach the communion table. Rather, to sin against Christ's body and blood must mean to deny the very purpose of his death, 
namely the formation of a new community of redeemed people whose lifestyle demonstrates the radical, transforming power of the cross. And so Paul says, what you're doing is really serious. And so before you come to the meal, you need to examine yourself. Verse 28, let a person examine himself then. And so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Verse 29 explains verse 28. The examination, well, it's in light of whether we understand the body or not. And to discern the body, well, that is talking about the church, and it's talking about whether we see each person in the church as they really are. Not by worldly criteria, but as equals at the foot of the cross. People who Jesus has died for and redeemed. His body. Perhaps you have a Sunday routine, a favorite breakfast, a coffee, maybe a run. Maybe there's no routine and it's all a bit chaotic. I know many will be praying before um, they come during the week, preparing by reading the passage. And Paul says, before we come to the Lord's Supper, well, we need to prepare, examine ourselves. Are we treating the body rightly? In the Book of Common Prayer, the minister is instructed to give advance notice of the Lord's Supper and to encourage the church to prepare to come. And that's not about a big introspection or depending on your own performance. It's actually about repentance, the normal Christian life, turning from sin and trusting in Jesus, our Savior. And specifically here, it's considering how we're treating one another. Well, here's advance notice. It is on the term card, but we are sharing the Lord's Supper together next Sunday. Well, it would be right to examine ourselves. It might be there's something we need to repent of before we come. It could be there's someone we sinned against and it would be right to confess and seek reconciliation. It might be there's someone who we need to forgive who sinned against us and is seeking reconciliation. And we do this so that when we come together to eat and drink, well, we don't come for judgment. For everyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. And that's quite a shocking verse, isn't it? Verse 30. A surprising verse, perhaps. But it is important to keep reading. Verse 31, but if we are judged, if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. You see, the judgment Paul's speaking about is not final judgment. It's describing God's fatherly discipline in his church. It's the language of correcting a wayward child. The same idea that some have seen in Hebrews 12, the loving discipline of a heavenly father for our good, that we might persevere until Jesus returns. So the behavior of the Corinthian church was very serious. But God in his kindness was acting in perhaps the only way that would make them wake up and repent so that they would prove themselves genuine and not face condemnation with the world when Jesus returns. God's church mattered so much to him that he would even discipline it, that we would live together rightly. Well, so what do we do with a verse like this today? I guess it could be tempting to try and explain it away and say things like that would never happen. Or it could be easy to overinterpret it and start going around saying every cough or sneeze must be because of a particular sin. We don't want to do either of those things. We don't want to ignore this, but we don't want to create a superstition about it. And it's helpful to remember that Paul was an apostle. He was an apostle who had unique authority to say this. We are not apostles, and so we don't have the authority to make statements about people, about one another, like verse 30. It's not our place to pronounce such verdicts on anyone. And actually, it would be hugely harmful to start suggesting if we're ill, we need to kind of match it up and find the sin, and then we'll get better. Now, this seems to be widespread in the church, and it's discipline for a corporate sin. And so seeing this principle of God's fatherly discipline in the church, well, I think it should prompt us to be willing to examine ourselves. 
And perhaps if illness comes or it's widespread in the church, well, we'd need to be asking, might there be a way we are living that is seriously at odds with the work of Jesus? And the answer might honestly be no. Or we might repent, and it might make no difference to our health, but we've continued to grow in Christ-likeness. We've heard the discipline of our Lord, and we trust our circumstances to our Heavenly Father. Paul says it's vital to understand who we are, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, because that will shape our life together. And this is our final point, vital to understand, to discern the body so that we wait for one another. Verse 33, so then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things. I will give directions when I come The application to wait might seem slightly underwhelming, but it's actually really profound because it's not me first. It's about you. It's about serving the other, honoring the other, loving the body of Christ. And in Corinth, this would have been huge. Imagine the difference at the meal. The wealthy open up their homes and they wait. And they wait as long as it takes. And as people arrive... They look and they don't see rich and poor and slave and free and the person I want to be with and the person I don't want to be with. They see the body of Christ, people Jesus died for, people Jesus shed his blood for, just like them. And so the food is prepared and it's for all to share in and the church begins to gather and it's a gathering full of honor and shame, uh, honor and not shame, self-sacrifice and love. Come in. Sit here, let me help you. And it's beautiful. And the world longs for this kind of love and unity, but it's only found in the church and it's only formed through the death of Jesus Christ. Well, as we close, are there any particular ways we need to examine ourselves as a church in light of this? That would be a good thing to be discussing together. As I've considered this, wonderfully, I don't think we're in the place the Corinthian church was. Across the church family, I see wonderful examples of self-sacrificial service that crosses social boundaries and crosses boundaries that the world rarely steps over. I think we do discern the body and we show it in many ways. I said this to someone earlier this week and they said, well, then we should give thanks to generations who've gone before us to teach us who we are. But we don't want to be complacent and we know we aren't perfect and there will be ways we've behaved more like Corinth. There'll always be a battle to live in light of the gospel and not to absorb the values of the world. And so we want to examine ourselves. Personally, I've been challenged just to think, well, where is self-promotion driving me and not service of others whom Jesus has redeemed by his precious blood? Perhaps we might want to ask, are there any groups of people that we we never speak to? Or we want to be watchful that we don't just start to form or pursue inner rings or cliques that exclude others in the body. We're a varied, we're an international group on Sunday morning. I think it gives us just a wonderful opportunity to display our unity in Christ more and more as we seek to serve one another and encourage one another across different cultures. And on the 12th of June, we've even got to bring your own lunch. It's an opportunity to put this really into practice. And I don't think it's to make us fret about the menu, but it's about that attitude of love and service and honor to one another. There are so many opportunities to live this out, to live out who Jesus made us. Verse 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the great work of Jesus upon the cross, 
so that we might together be your people. Please forgive us when we fail to treat one another as you call us to, but help us to see who we really are, that we might be a church full of honor and service and love. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.